Pastor, could you open in prayer? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything. Lord, our lives are a gift from you. Those who we have in our life are a gift from you. Lord, we thank you for even this church and for the lives that have gathered here. They are a gift from you. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for, for your written word, for your son, for our relationship with you. Lord, I just pray that we would maximize the day, that we wouldn't lose the day to have an opportunity to praise you with people that we love, but Lord, that we would use this time for your honor and for your glory. Pray for these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So last, or recently I did a lesson on the importance of worldview, and today we're going to see an example of how we can use our biblical Christian worldview to examine another one as a, as a lens examines, as you use like a magnifying glass to look at something. Um, now, the title of this message is deliberately controversial. I titled it, R Critical Race Theory is of the spirit of Antichrist. And I'm going to support that in this and how we can see this. And I did this specifically to get our attention. That we need to understand that this idea of critical race theory, which is invading the church, is the spirit of Antichrist. Um, and a lot of what I got, I got from a YouTube video from the uh, channel, is Genesis, or Genesis, is Genesis History. And they talk about different topics like this. And, they, and this was a full hour message and he talks about critical race theory. He also plays clips of prominent Christian leaders, uh, including someone high up in the Southern Baptist churches, and also Tim Keller and others, where they make statements that support critical race theory. So this is an idea that has started to invade our church. And in the area of worldview, we have to understand that in this case, we're looking at the fact that there are two worldviews. Man's word versus God's word. And that's how we're going to look at this topic today. Um, and again, uh, the, the first heading I have here is, there is no such thing as neutrality. Does somebody want to read... Romans chapter 8. Yep, verses 6 through 8 says, For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh are not able to please God. Notice here, it sets itself against God. And also, they are unable to please God. So we see that there is this idea here. Um, somebody want to read James 4, 4. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world sets himself as an enemy of God. And Jesus himself even said, and this was in Matthew 12, 30. He says, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. So we're seeing polar opposites, opposed viewpoints. So we have this idea of God's word versus man's word. And as we examine critical race theory, we are going to see that critical race theory is man's word, which sets itself up 
against the gospel of Christ. So, I also wanted to look at what the spirit of Antichrist is so that we understand that what I'm saying actually is supported by the scriptures. So, somebody want to read 1 John 2, 21 and 22. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. And again, John in 1 John uses or talks about the Antichrist, or there are many Antichrists. And here also he says in 1 John 4, 1 through 3, Somebody want to read that? Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming and now it is already in the world. So again, John is telling us that the spirit of Antichrist is already here and it is manifest in false teachers. So let's get that straight. False teachers are of the spirit of Antichrist. False teachers who proclaim man's word against God's word are of the spirit of Antichrist. Somebody want to read um, 1 Corinthians 3, 18 to 20. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness before God. For it is written... He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, that they are useless. So again, we're looking at the fact that God understands and he sees these reasonings. And they may make them or try to make them sound intelligent. And many people in the world will judge these statements as wise but are they truly wise? Somebody want to read um, 2 Corinthians 10.5. As we tear down speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to the obedience of God, of Christ. So we can... Oh, I'm sorry. So we can define the spirit of Antichrist as any philosophy, speculation, or worldview that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Okay, that last part is a note that I wrote. And basically what I'm saying here is that this is what the spirit of Antichrist is all about. False teachers teach man's word versus God's word. And I I just wanted to have up here... As we start looking at critical race theory, we're going to see at the beginning of it, man's word says, I define what sin is. God's word says, God defines what sin is. And I want to read here, um, and again, I have this title, Examining CRT with the lens of the biblical worldview. And that's what we're looking at. Man's word, I define what sin is. God's word, God defines what sin is. This is actually from the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. I put a little bit.ly link in there so that you can find it easily if you ever want to look it up. Um, I, I also shortened it, and I added a couple comments that you won't find in the, on the website, but it's the, 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 the basic, the, this is a quote from this site. 
It says CS, CRT recognizes. In other words, they are making an assumption here that racism is ingrained in the fabric and system of the American society. And then further down in the, in the thing we see, this is the analytical lens, think worldview, that CRT uses in examining existing power structures, power structures. This analytical lens is their worldview. And then it says, CRT identifies that these power structures are based on white privilege and white supremacy, which perpetuates the marginalized, marginalization of people of color. That's what they're saying is there. Um, CRT actually redefines white supremacy as any belief, behavior, or system that supports, promotes, or enhances white privilege. This is taken from a book by Vadi Bakum, Fault Lines. I've read this book. It is a very good book. Um, and one of the things that we see in, in this, what it's talking about, is CRT divides society into two groups, the oppressors and the oppressed. If you are an oppressor, you are a sinner. Man's word defines what sin is. If you're not an oppressor, you're not a sinner. And this is where it sets itself against the gospel. If I am white, which is what CRT talks about in this idea of white privilege and white supremacy, if I am white, then I am automatically a sinner. Of course, the Bible says all have sinned, but we'll look at that in a minute. But in this case, I can't be redeemed. If I'm not white, I'm not a sinner. Therefore, like the Pharisees, I don't need a physician. I don't need to be redeemed. So in both cases, critical race theory sets itself up against the gospel. It is unscriptural on many levels, including the fact that it is anti-Christian, anti-Christ. I wanted to show you another slide. This slide here is a book. The name of the book is Not My Idea. This is the link or the page right from Amazon.com. This was published back in September of 2018. And it is actually being used in many schools to teach what critical race theory is all about. And what are some of the things that it teaches? Well, inside is a, is a set of two pages like this, and I'm gonna show you the picture of that. On the left you see, whiteness is a bad deal. It always was. And then underneath it shows this little thing that says, dude, we can see your pointy tail. And then you see this contract on the right side. And this contract is being presented by the devil with money behind it. And it says, binding you to whiteness. You get stolen land, stolen riches, special favors. Whiteness gets to mess endlessly with the lives of your family, neighbors, loved ones, and fellow humans of color, your soul sign below. This teaches, if you're white, you're evil. It's as simple as that. And this is what they're teaching kids in school. 
I can't think of a, uh, any more racist statement than that. That is telling you, calling you a racist by being racist themselves. They call that projection. Can you do the mic so it can get on the recording? Sorry. You got it. Oh, okay. Hello? There we go. Okay. The people who believe that, they don't believe that um, black or any people of color can be racist. That's exactly part of it. And that's why I said that you don't need to be redeemed if you're of color. You can't be racist, so... You can't be a sinner. You can't be an oppressor. So you are the oppressed. So you're right. And that's part of this whole thing of man's word versus God's word. Man's word setting itself up against God's word. So again... we see this idea is now becoming something that is truth in the world. Truth especially in American society. Now, I'm going to take a look at the second, or the first implication that we get from this. I define who is a sinner? God says, all have sinned in Romans 3, 23. As a matter of fact, somebody want to read Romans 3, 10, and, 10 through 12. As it is written, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Okay. Mary, would you like to read the... For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, so we see here, God's word says all have sinned. Man's word says I say who is a sinner. And of course, I'm not one of them. Now we want to look at the next implication, which is what is on the outside makes you a sinner. In other words, what is on the outside defiles a man? Whereas God says, what is on the inside? Somebody want to read Mark 7, 14 and 15. And after he called the crowd to him again, he began saying to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defiles the man. And then Matthew 15, 18 to 20 say, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. Jesus is dealing with a controversy that the scribes and the Pharisees dealt with here, but he's also saying something that is key to the gospel. This key to the gospel is everyone is a sinner 
And defilement is not what you look like, but who you are inside. And defilement belongs to every human being that has not been redeemed. The only way to become undefiled is for Christ to wash your sins away. Once that's happened, those sins have been dealt with. But if you set yourself up and say, well, it's not that, it's getting to heaven by doing good works. All sorts of other ways that they can try and say, this is how I get to heaven. It sets itself up against the gospel. Okay, the next implication we see is this. I am responsible for the sins of my ancestors. Scriptures are very clear on this issue. See, that's one of the things that they're trying to do in terms of reparations, is that they're trying to give money to pay for the sins. And we, being white, are guilty of those sins because we are white. But the scriptures say this. Somebody want to read Ezekiel 18, 4? Behold, all souls are mine, the soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul whose sins will die. So here he's saying the soul of the one whose sins will die. And then just to be more explicit in Second Kings, it says this. You want to read that? But the sons of those who struck him down, he did not put to death. According to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, which Yahweh commanded, saying... Fathers shall not be put to death for their sons, nor sons be put to death for their fathers, but each shall be put to death for his own sin. So, and this is a quote actually from Deuteronomy 24, 16. I put that in parentheses at the end of this quote. This is a command that God gave through Moses to Israel. You are guilty for your own sin, you will not be put to death for your father's sin. And your father won't be put to death for your sin. That was a command from God. So this idea of us being guilty for the sins of our ancestors goes contrary, again, to God's word. The next implication that we see from critical race theory is there is no redemption. And I talked about this a little bit earlier. And again, this sets itself directly against the gospel of Christ. There is no redemption if the outside is what makes you a sinner. As a matter of fact, there's this controversial thing that Koch denies, but supposedly somebody leaked the fact that Koch had a critical race theory training in which they had a slide that said, try to be less white. That's impossible. Therefore, redemption is impossible, according to critical race theory. Somebody want to read... Um, Hang on. Yeah, Romans 3, 23 through 25. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation for, in his blood through faith for a demonstration of his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. And then 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31 say, but by his doing, 
you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that just as it is written, let him boast, boast in the Lord. And somebody want to read Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you also, after, li after listening to the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance unto the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. So, as we listen to the gospel of salvation and believed... We were sealed in him by the Holy Spirit of promise who was given as a pledge of our redemption. The Holy Spirit lives in us because we have been redeemed. Then I wanted to read these last couple of verses here. Um, I titled this heading, Let Him Be Accursed. And this has to do with any who preach another gospel. Paul says this in, a, in Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9. I marveled that you sir, are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to the gospel we have proclaimed to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again. Now, if any man is proclaiming to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let him be accursed. And then Jesus proclaimed the same curse. In Luke 17, 1 and 2, it says this. Now he said to his disciple, it is inevitable that a stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. That's the person who preaches another gospel. If, now it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. That's why it's so important to get things right with respect to the scripture. When we talk to other people about Christ, are we saying things that will cause them to stumble? Take care. There's a d very important responsibility for us to understand, to seek the truth of the Bible and to seek to proclaim the truth of the Bible and confront these other gospels which, as I said earlier, are of the spirit of Antichrist. Go ahead, John. When you were talking about, um, you know, if you're white, you're bad. Um, and it, we, when you veer away from the scriptures, you get all kinds of distortions. And I was thinking about a meeting I had with a friend the other day, because technically, I'm not white, I'm black. And that's the mentality. Well, this gentleman I was with is from over in the Horseheads area, and he said the Horsehead School has a special room for kids who if they feel like they're a cat one day, they can go into that room. They have a cat room. 
And that's when you veer off from the Bible, then the distortions get greater. Right. And that is the, the, another part of this whole thing is that when there is no God, I forget who I'm quoting, but I've heard this said many times, when there is no God, all things are permissible. If there is no God, very truly, there is nothing we can rely on in terms of reality. And that's why these theories start coming in, because there is no reality. There's no this, there's no morality either. There's no basis for morality. But this is something that shows that people become unhinged when they abandon God. As a matter of fact, it's interesting. Isaiah, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, what was it that, they said, that he said? I am undone. Actually, that means I am disintegrated. I am completely unhinged. When he realized just what sin had done to him, he realized there was no hope until God commanded that a coal be used to cleanse his lips. Another picture of redemption, where through the fire of judgment, Isaiah was purged of his sin. Was Isaiah judged? No. That was a coal from the altar of sacrifice. What was that altar of sacrifice? The cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he died on that altar of sacrifice that purged us all from our sins. If you set yourself against that, you are not only under God's judgment, but you become unhinged the further you take yourself away from God. The further and harder you set yourself against God, the worse it will be for you. That's why the gospel is a controversial thing. Jesus said, I don't come to bring peace. I come to bring a sword. That sword is controversy. That sword is separating the sinner from the saint. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the love and the grace and the kindness that you have shown to us. Lord, we know that we should not be harsh when dealing with others. But we also understand that there is a harsh truth that others need to be made aware of. That harsh truth is your wrath is real. And we pray that you'd help us to be the watchman that blows the trumpet that warns others of the wrath to come that your name may be glorified, that they may be saved, and that they may become part of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen.